Well, welcome again uh, to uh, the uh, class on Leviticus, Leviticus for Beginners, uh, Training for Holiness. This is lesson number seven in our, uh, in our series. It's uh, entitled Attaining Holiness. Uh, and we're going to be talking about peace offerings and summarize some of this material uh, in this third part of uh, the section that we've been uh, going over. Uh, Leviticus chapter 7 verses 1138. Well, I explained that Leviticus is a book of instruction about the Jewish sacrificial system and it provided information for both the one who was offering the sacrifice as well as the one who was presenting, the priest who was presenting the sacrifice to God um, and the role that each one played in the uh, offering of sacrifices. Now when explaining the responsibilities from the uh, one offering the sacrifice, the sacrifices are listed in the following order. You have um, uh, burnt offerings uh, are talked about, are explained first, then grain offerings, peace offerings, sin offerings, and guilt offerings. However, when the author Moses, the inspired writer of Leviticus, explains the presenter or the priestly responsibilities and manner of presenting the sacrifice uh, to God, the list of the types of sacrifices are presented in a different order. And there's the order. First are the grain offerings, then the sin offerings, then the guilt offerings, the burnt offerings, and the final one, the peace offerings. Now I've, I've looked and researched uh, this, uh, you know, the difference in the order, and uh, no, no uh, reason for this is given. I couldn't find any, uh, even if there uh, is one. And so uh, don't be confused if you notice that uh, at first the author uh, you know, talks about the, uh, the, uh, the sacrifices in one order, and then when he explains what the uh, priestly duties are, he, uh, he talks about them in a, in a different uh, order. Uh, in this lesson uh, today, we're going to look at the instructions for the priests concerning the peace offering, and then a summary of all the offerings to familiarize ourselves with these sacrifices which were the, uh, the key element in, the Jewish, uh, in Jewish worship. Everything in Jewish worship um, uh, you know, surrounded the offering of uh, sacrifices. So let's begin by reading in chapter seven, verse 11. It says, now this is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which shall be presented to the Lord. So as we read, uh, as we read on rather, uh, we'll see that the rules uh, here mostly have to do with what part of the sacrifice the priest uh, could keep and eat or not eat, as well as uh, who else could share in the food. So there are rules about not only how the sacrifices are supposed to be presented, but also which part of the sacrifices could be kept by the priest and also by the one who uh, was offering the sacrifice. So we keep reading verse 12. It says, uh, if he offers it by way of thanksgiving, then along with the sacrifice of thanksgiving, he shall offer unleavened cakes mixed with oil and unleavened wafers spread with oil and cakes of well-stirred fine flour mixed with oil. With the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving, he shall present his offering with cakes of leavened bread. Of this he shall present one of every offering as a contribution to the Lord. It shall belong to the priest who sprinkles the blood of the peace offerings. A couple of more verses. Now, as for the flesh of the sacrifice of his thanksgiving peace offering, it shall be eaten on the day of his offering. He shall not leave any of it over until morning. But if the sacrifice of his offering is a votive or a free will offering, it shall be eaten on the day that he offers his sacrifice and on the next day what is left of it may be eaten. But what is left over from the flesh of the sacrifice on the third day shall be burned with fire. And one more 
So if any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offering should ever be eaten on the third day, he who offers it will not be accepted and it will not be reckoned to his benefit. It shall be an offense thing, an offensive thing, and the person who eats of it will bear his own iniquity. So uh, the rules here were very specific as we see from this passage. In this passage, the reader learns for the first time that the peace offering could be used for three purposes. Number one, the peace offering could be used as a thank offering, expressing gratitude for deliverance of some kind, perhaps deliverance from illness or enemies or adversity, or perhaps for blessings that have been granted to the individuals and even prayers that have been uh, answered. All of these, uh, an individual can offer a peace offering specifically as a thank offering. It could also be offered as a votive offering. This is when a blessing had been granted or a deliverance given in response to a vow made in connection with the answered prayer. In other words, the person who is offering the sacrifice said, Dear God, if you do this, I will do this. If you, you, know, if you grant this, then I will offer uh, such and such. Okay, so that's a, that's a, votive, uh, a votive offering. So uh, what the writer is saying, a peace offering could be used as a thank, thanksgiving. It could also be used as a votive offering. And thirdly, as a free will offering. A free will offering was an offering simply to express one's joy and gratitude towards God with no specific reason or occasion. It was spontaneous joy. I love the Lord, I just want to do something. I am happy and content in, 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 in my God and I want to do something for my God. I want to show Him and express my, uh, my gratitude. So that's a free will uh, offering. Therefore, the instructions for peace offerings were tied to the type of peace offering that was being made. For example, if it was a thank offering, the animal in question was presented accompanied with a grain offering done in one of several ways. For example, the worshiper could present unleavened cakes or wafers. Uh, wafers were thin cake, think uh, you know, thin crust pizza, uh, those are thin, uh, thin wafers which uh, were made with fine flour and they were spread with, uh, with uh, olive oil. Uh, it could also, uh, you could also bring regular cakes made with uh, leaven. Uh, part of every element offered, whether it be animal or various grain products, were given to the priest. A heave offering uh, were the parts offered up to God and offered up to the priests as opposed to the portions left uh, for the one offering the uh, sacrifice. So it was the priestly portion. And then the part of the animal left after the sacrifice had been made had to be eaten on the same day that the animal was sacrificed. This was to encourage fellowship and sharing as a family, friends, and uh, the poor were invited to attend the sacrificial ritual and then sharing the meal afterwards. It was a joyful event. It was meant to be shared, meant to be a blessing. The next uh, set of rules were for the votive and the free will offerings. These two uh, followed the same procedures except for one thing. The food belonging to the offerer had to be eaten on the same day or the following day, but not on the third day. If food was eaten on the third day, then the benefit of the sacrifice was annulled and the individual became a sinner. In other words, uh, all this effort to offer something to God turned out to be a sin because the food was eaten on the third day against uh, God's uh, command. Um, an extra day was given since votive and free will sacrifices were more personal in nature and a smaller number of people usually accompanied the one who was offering the sacrifice. Thus, 
they were given a little bit more time to uh, eat uh, you know, the food that was available and reflect on uh, what had been done. We read in Leviticus chapter seven, uh, verses 19 to 21, also the flesh that touches anything unclean shall not be eaten, it shall be burned with fire. As for other flesh, anyone who is clean may eat such flesh, but the person who eats the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which belong to the Lord in his uncleanness, that person shall be cut off from his people. When anyone touches anything unclean, whether human uncleanness or an unclean animal or any unclean detestable thing, and eats of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings which belong to the Lord, that person shall be cut off uh, from, his, uh, from his people. So here we have a, a negative rule, if you wish, concerning the eating of the meat from the animal that had been uh, offered as a sacrifice, as a peace offering. So there were, you know, there were general rules about clean and unclean in relation to sacrifices. For example, meat and flesh that had touched anything unclean was not to be eaten. This is because by touching something unclean, the meat being offered also became unclean. And then eating that meat would make the person unclean. So that unclean meat was to be burned with fire. Uh, secondly, a person who was unclean for whatever reason could not eat the meat from the peace offering no matter what reason uh, it was offered. It could be offered as a, you know, as a votive offering, a free for whatever reason it was offered. If you were unclean, you couldn't, you couldn't eat uh, of that sacrifice. And we remember why, right? We're talking about holiness. Holiness, a holy God demands a holy people and a holy people become that way by following God's instructions concerning the sacrificial system. So if you were unclean for any reason and came into contact with the sacrifice, then uh, you, know, you spoiled the sacrifice, all right? Now, the reason for these prohibitions was that the animal in question, along with the persons offering it, were devoting something to the Lord. So they and what they offered had to be holy as the law defined what holy was. Remember, the sacrificial system was assigned to, designed rather, to create holiness in God's people. And the rules were there to help them separate themselves from the world, from what was uh, unholy, and also what was clean from unclean according to God. You know, it's, it's not as if the, the, the Jews are the ones that made up those rules. God is the one that said this was clean and this was unclean. This animal is clean, this animal is unclean. The, the role of the Jews was to follow the instructions that God had given them and in doing so, they themselves uh, became holy before the Lord. Another rule, anyone who violated these rules knowingly were to be cut off from their people. And uh, of course, there's, you know, there's, uh, I've mentioned this before, there was a lot of speculation as to what that meant, you know, being cut off from your people. Uh, it could mean uh, being ostracized by the people, you know, by the Israelites. Uh, it could mean capital punishment. It could mean God sending premature death. Uh, it could mean God would exterminate the person's lineage. Uh, you know, the consensus and the context uh, from what I've read support the first view. To be cut off from the people was to be ostracized. Today we'd, we'd say disfellowship from the, uh, from the assembly. We continue to read in chapter seven, verse 22. It says, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel saying, you shall not eat any fat from an ox, a sheep, or a goat. Also the fat of an animal which dies and the fat of an animal torn by beasts may be put to any other use, but you must certainly not eat it. For whoever eats the fat of the animal from which an offering by fire is offered to the Lord, even the person who eats shall be cut off from his people. You are not to eat any blood, either of bird or animal, 
in any of your dwellings. Any person who eats any blood, even that person shall be cut off from his people. And so these were the prohibitions regarding fat and blood, not only in the context of offering sacrifices uh, to God, but also in the regular management of livestock and the handling of animals and, and, and birds. They, uh, they were not uh, to eat the fat of animals, whether they were uh, slaughtered uh, for food or uh, they died in some other way. Uh, when animals were sacrificed and meat was left to, to eat, as in the peace offering, the fat was not to be eaten under the punishment of being cut off from the people. And if you are cut off from God's people, you no longer belong to God and you no longer enjoyed the blessings and the protection that came with the relationship uh, between yourself and God. They uh, were not allowed to eat the blood of the animal either. This law had originally been given to Noah in Genesis chapter 9, verse 24. And this rule also held for private consumption or eating the blood of an animal uh, that was uh, sacrificed. We know uh, from previous teaching that the life was in the blood. And so by sprinkling some upon the altar where the sacrifice was burned and at times, if it was a sin offering, sprinkling blood before the veil of the Holy of Holies. The blood was used to signify that a life was being both offered in death and specifically offered to God. To eat the fat was presumptuous because you were taking God's position for yourself or rather God's portion for yourself. To eat the blood was sacrilegious because it contained the essence of life and could only be offered to God. It, it, it was a spiritual thing. A reminder that one who had violated these rules unintentionally could offer a sin or guilt sacrifice in order to be restored. We continue reading in Leviticus chapter seven. It says, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the sons of Israel saying, he who offers the sacrifice of his peace offerings to the Lord shall bring his offering to the Lord from the sacrifice of his peace offerings. His own hands are to bring the offerings by fire to the Lord. He shall bring the fat with the breast that the breast may be presented as a wave offering before the Lord. The priest shall offer up the fat in smoke on the altar, but the breast shall belong to Aaron uh, and his sons. You shall give the right thigh to the priest as a contribution from the sacrifices of your peace offerings. The one among the sons of Aaron who offers the blood of the peace offerings and the fat, the right thigh shall be his as his portion. For I have taken the breast of the wave offering and the thigh of the contribution from the sons of Israel from the sacrifices of their peace offerings and have given them to Aaron the priest and to his sons as their due forever from the sons of Israel. This is that which is consecrated to Aaron and that which is consecrated to his sons from the offerings by fire to the Lord in that day when he presented them to serve as priests to the Lord. These the Lord had commanded to be given them from the sons of Israel in the day that he anointed them. It is their due forever throughout their generations. And so there were also uh, positive uh, provisions for the priests, uh, uh, not only negative uh, prohibitions, for example, the breast of the animal that was to be sacrificed uh, as, a, priest, uh, as a, a peace offering, that breast belonged to the priest. It was lifted up uh, as a wave offering. It was a way to present it to the Lord since the sacrifice was his, but it wasn't put on the altar. Instead, it was kept for the priest 
as God's representative. So a wave offering means they lifted it up before the Lord to say, this is yours, you know, Lord, you know, uh, in, in reality, it's yours, but they didn't put it on the altar. They held it back, why? Because God said, you can keep that portion for, your, for yourself. The fat of the animal, however, that was put on the altar, that was burned on the altar and offered to the Lord. In addition, the right thigh where the meat was, was also given to the priest. It is stipulated that the breast and the right thigh of the peace offerings were to be their provisions forever, along with the major portion of all the grain offerings. And so sin, guilt, and burnt offerings left no portions for the priests since the entire animal was burned to ashes. However, priests were due their portions from the day they were ordained. They were to receive these forever, it says in the, uh, in the passage, meaning so long as the law of Moses was in effect and practiced, or for the rest of the age. That's what forever meant at that time among the Jews. And so the priests shared these provisions among themselves so there was to be no hoarding or uh, any of the priests in need. And we read about that in uh, Leviticus 7 verse 10, where it says, every grain offering mixed with oil or dry shall belong to all the sons of Aaron, to all alike. They all shared, okay? Different priests were on duty, offered different sacrifices. The portions that were given to the priests were collected by the different priests and they shared these together uh, uh, fairly, equally, uh, so that there would be no one uh, who would be in, uh, in need. So we keep reading Leviticus uh, chapter seven, this time in verse 37. It says, this is the law of the burnt offering, the grain offering and the sin offering and the guilt offering and the ordination offering and the sacrifice and uh, peace uh, offerings. Uh, which the Lord commanded Moses at Mount Sinai in the day that he commanded the sons of Israel to present their offerings to the Lord in the wilderness of, uh, of Sinai. So this uh, summary statement concludes the instructions for the sacrificial system to be practiced by God's people. God names each sacrifice and he, he adds the ordination offering, which may refer to the grain offerings made by and for the high priest on the day that he was anointed or that he was consecrated. Moses also states when uh, these were given by God, they were given by God at Mount Sinai and when the people began to offer them, they began to offer them while they wandered in the wilderness, you know, they would stay in one place for a time and then they were signaled to leave that place to, to move somewhere else. The Levites would come in, they would tear down and pack up carefully all of the uh, uh, tabernacle, uh, all of the uh, objects that uh, were used, uh, the, uh, the, the altar of uh, burnt uh, offerings, uh, the ark, the table of incense, you know, all these things had a way of being packed and carried and they would carry these things on foot uh, to the next location and when they arrived at the next location then everything was you know, taken apart, put, put back together again and uh, the, uh, the sacrificial system would continue in that uh, particularly, uh, in that particular location. So, we, uh, we've looked at the uh, sacrificial system given as the core element of uh, Jewish uh, worship. Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, all inclusive. Um, it was all inclusive uh, religious uh, and spiritual system that consumed time and a person's wealth and careful observance in order to comply. However, when the, you know, when the sacrificial system was fulfilled, in other words, when a, uh, you know, uh, one of the uh, Israelites came with their sacrifice and uh, they did what they were supposed to do in preparation and then the priest carried through and did what he was supposed to do, 
Uh, well, then, uh, you know, certain things uh, uh, took place. There was a, a concrete uh, result that took place. Uh, for example, this created a truly distinct religious experience unlike anything practiced by surrounding nations. Yes, the system was cumbersome. Yes, the system was expensive and it took time and deliberation and you had to know what you were doing and all that. However, it was different than anything being practiced by anyone around them. No one had ever seen anything like this uh, before. It also brought the individual before God and interacted with God in a sure, meaning the worshiper knew what to do and why to do it. Uh, so the sacrificial system was a sure method. The, the worshiper had no doubt that what he did was what God wanted and it was the way that God wanted it. There was no, there was no guessing. The worshiper also had concrete blessings as the result of his worship. He received forgiveness. Uh, he received peace of mind, uh, satisfaction, joy, and, and hope, uh, knowing that he had completed uh, 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 an act of worship uh, exactly as God had uh, required it and uh, was uh, receiving the blessings that God promised because of it. No other religion provided these features because no other system or religion produced holiness in its uh, practitioners, uh, or even had holiness as its goal. I mean, pagan religions, you know, they had goals. Gratification of the senses, uh, creating a sense of awe in the person, or fear, or relief, or mystery, or celebration, yes. But none of these religions produced holiness and none of them created a nearness to the true and living God. Only the Israelites had a religion and a, a religious system that created those objectives. Since these sacrifices were at the heart of the Jewish worship and a preview of the ultimate sacrifice and salvation to come, I'd like to finish this lesson with a brief review and summary of each offering and sacrifice in the system before we move on to other features of the Jewish religious system, including the priests and their garments, the place of worship and various festivals and observances throughout the year, as well as uh, rules of conduct for the people. We're gonna start those uh, in our next lesson, but for now, I'd like to do a review and summary of the various offerings and sacrifices. Now, the Jews did not begin offering sacrifices at this time, I mentioned that before. They had been building altars and offering sacrifices since the time of uh, Cain and Abel. We read about that in Genesis chapter four. God provided the instructions about sacrifices to instruct how the people were to offer sacrifices in the tabernacle which they had just built. I mean, you know, they spent a considerable amount of time, energy, and resources building the tabernacle, but they didn't know exactly what to do with the tabernacle. And uh, uh, priests were appointed, but the priests didn't know uh, what their task was in uh, uh, serving in the uh, uh, tabernacle uh, complex. As I've said, there were five major kind of offerings and Jesus, uh, excuse me, and the Lord began teaching the people about these uh, various uh, kinds of offerings. So one more time, just to clarify it in our minds, the first of these was the burnt offerings, Leviticus 1, uh, verse 1 to verse 17. Uh, that explains the um, uh, the offerer's uh, responsibility. And then chapter six, verse eight to 13, that explains the priest's duties in offering the burnt offering. And so in the burnt offerings, an animal was offered, whether a bull or sheep or birds, and the one offering would lay hands on the animals first, uh, put his hands on the animal's head, thus identifying with it 
The worshiper would then slaughter the animal, except birds. Uh, these uh, were offered by the poor and the priest would be the ones who would kill those uh, animals. After which the priest would place the animal on the altar and burn it completely to, uh, to ashes. The burning of the complete animal signified an offering totally consecrated to the Lord. And by virtue of bringing the animal and laying hands on its head, the worshiper was also signifying his complete consecration and devotion to the Lord. And so the burnt offering was a way uh, that the worshiper expressed his desire to be wholly devoted in every way to God. It, it was a great act of piety uh, by the worshiper. So those are the, that's the burnt offering. The next offering was the grain offering, Leviticus chapter two, verses one to 16. That's the worshiper's part. And then Leviticus chapter six, verses 14 to 23. That's the part that the priest played. So grain or cereal offerings consisted of fine flour with oil or frankincense. Uh, it was offered in this way or baked into bread or cakes or wafers also offered with oil and frankincense. Only a small portion was actually put on the altar by the priest. The balance was given and kept by the priest. Most offerings, you know, grain offerings, were made without leaven, but seasoned with salt as a reminder of the covenant that had been made with God and the Israelites. Grain offerings usually were given along with animal sacrifices offered as burnt or peace offerings. The third type of offering we've talked about is the peace offering. Again, the worshiper's part, Leviticus chapter three, verses one to 17. The priest's part, Leviticus chapter seven, verses 11 to 36. Now the word for peace offering is related to the Hebrew word shalom, which means peace or well-being. This sacrifice was shared by the Lord, the worshiper and the priest in that each one received part of the animal. The fat, the liver, the kidneys, this was burnt on the altar for the Lord. The breast and the right thigh, this was waved before the Lord, but it was kept by the priest. The, uh, the, uh, the, the rest of the animal was uh, given to the uh, worshiper. The nature of sharing in this sacrifice was to celebrate and maintain peace between God and man, as well as between man and man. That's why they called it the peace offering, right? It was an attempt to maintain peace between man and God and at times between uh, uh, fellow Israelites. Uh, now there were three types of peace offerings. There was the Thanksgiving offering, uh, which was to express general gratitude. There was the votive offering uh, related to the completion of a vow. And then there was the free will offering, which celebrated and gave thanks for fellowship with other believers. All peace offerings, but the, a, a peace offering that was for thanksgiving, a peace offering that was for a votive peace offering that was a free will offering, okay? But always a peace offering. A unique feature of the peace offering was that the worshiper had to eat his portion on the day or the day after uh, the sacrifice was made. And so this led to the peace offering becoming an occasion for a fellowship meal with the worshiper along with his family or friends. Uh, it was a solemn occasion, but it was also an occasion of great joy um, for um, um, uh, Israelites and, uh, and their family. The fourth kind of offering was sin offerings. Again, Leviticus chapter four, verse one to Leviticus chapter five, 13. This explains the worshiper's role. Then chapter six, 24 to 30 explained the priest's role. Now the sin offering was made for the following reasons. First, if the anointed priest sinned, 
So the sin offering was if the priest or even the high priest sins, then he will be making a sin offering. Secondly, if the whole congregation sins, if the whole nation falls into idolatry, the sacrifice to be offered would be a sin offering on behalf of the nation. Thirdly, if a leader of the people sins, uh, the uh, Israelites were made up of different family groups and clans. And so if you were the leader of a family or a clan or something like that, and you sinned, uh, then the sin offering was the offering that you would make for your sin. And if one of the common people sinned, uh, this was the offering made for um, forgiveness of their sins, atonement, and the forgiveness that came with it. Some elements of the sacrifice remained the same no matter who was making the sin offering. For example, the sin was done in ignorance or unintentionally, or there was no sacrifice for sins done in defiance or rebellion. These sinners were cut off from their people. Again, Numbers chapter 15. Uh, another feature is that an animal without defect was sacrificed, um, uh, but uh, someone who was poor could offer birds instead of uh, an animal. And if the sacrifice was done correctly, the atonement was, uh, was made and the sin was forgiven, uh, whether uh, it was uh, the priest or high priest who sinned or the lowest or poorest Israelite, if he sinned and he offered a sin offering, his sin was atoned for and, for and forgiven. So God made ways for everyone to have access, uh, to have their sins atoned for and to receive the relief uh, of having their sins forgiven. And then the fifth one, the fifth offering was the guilt offerings. Again, Leviticus chapter five, verse 14 to chapter six, verse seven, uh, the task of the worshiper. And then chapter seven, verses one to seven, uh, the work of the priest in offering the guilt offering. A guilt offering is also called a trespass offering or a reparation offering depending on which uh, Bible translation you have. It was similar to the sin offering in that it was for unintentional sins and the procedure for offering uh, a, a guilt offering was the same as for a sin offering. Now the main difference was that uh, restitution of some kind was added to the sacrifice. This suggests that the sin offerings were for offenses against God and his holy things, and guilt offerings were for offenses against other people and their possessions. It seems that the first three kinds of offerings, burnt offering, grain offering, peace offering, these were voluntary, but the sin and the guilt offerings were required to atone for and receive forgiveness for sins against God and other people. Well, nowadays we have offerings as well. We offer things to God as well, not only in the Old Testament. We don't offer animals anymore or grain, but we do have specific things that we offer. And I want to talk about this, but before I want us to read Colossians chapter two, verses 16 and 17. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Here Paul is denouncing false teachers who were trying to impose various observances of the law on Christians. And he says that the things of the law, including the sacrificial system that we're studying today, the things of the law are merely a shadow or a preview of what we would have in Christ. For example, sacrifices. In Hebrews uh, chapter 7, 26 and 7, we read the following. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest 
holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Of course, the writer here is speaking of, uh, of uh, Christ, right? Christ offered himself. And so uh, today we have, we have sacrifice, but we don't sacrifice animals. Uh, it's the Son of God that was sacrificed his perfect human body, his perfect life was sacrificed to pay for the sins of everyone once and for all time. And so yes, we have sacrifice. We have a quote sacrificial system today, except the sacrifice that, that is brought to, uh, you know, to pay for our sins is Christ himself. And he's sacrificed only one time and, and, and his sacrifice pays for the sins of not just one sinner, but for all sinners who believe in him. Today, we also have offerings. Christians now offer themselves as living sacrifices through holy living and Christian service. Paul talks about that in Romans 12. He says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So we have offerings, right? But we don't offer grain or we don't offer animals anymore. What we offer is ourselves. We're the sacrifice that, that is offered before God uh, through our spiritual service, uh, our, our spiritual service to others in the name of Christ. This is, this is, this is the body that we offer uh, uh, to God today. This is what, you know, the aroma uh, that is soothing to Him. Believers who in the name of Christ are serving others, are proclaiming the gospel, are ministering to those who are poor and who are in need. We also have incense today. In Revelation 5.8, John writes, when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So today the incense uh, is not perfume that we mix and make, it's the prayers and, 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 uh, and the, pra the, the prayers and the requests of the saints that go up to God as a, as a sweet aroma. So we have incense today. Our prayers are the incense that go before God. We also have uh, praise today, the sacrifices of praise. In Hebrews 13, 15, it says, through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. The singing of the saints in worship, this is what uh, is considered as praise uh, that is acceptable today. Don't get me wrong, some people think, well, in the Old Testament, they had to do things you know, the right way, according to God's will, this was holiness. There's nothing that has changed. Our, our sacrifices, our offerings, our incense, our praise has to be done according to God's will, according to his purpose, according to his instructions in order to be acceptable. Uh, but we do it differently uh, today. The giving of service, um, the good deeds that are done in the name of Christ these rise up to God as an acceptable and pleasing uh, offering. Uh, again, the Hebrew writer says, and do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Do you, do you see, the, do you see the, 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 um, the examples? Do you see the, the previews? The Hebrew writer is using the same language that uh, Moses used 
uh, about sacrifices and uh, uh, being acceptable to God. It uses exactly the same type of references except uh, he's describing the fulfillment of these things that take place in the Christian's life, all right? Uh, so uh, the giving of money, uh, it says here in Philippians 4.18, but I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, Paul says, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And so uh, giving money is one thing, but when it is done sacrificially and cheerfully, uh, Paul says it's like a fragrant aroma. Well, he uses exactly the same words as Moses. When Moses talks about a, a sacrifice being done properly, it becomes a pleasing aroma to God. Well, today we, we don't sacrifice a $5,000 bull, but we do put you know, the equivalent amount uh, you know, as our contribution over the period of a year, uh, it becomes a, a, a sacrifice that is uh, pleasing to God. And then of course, self-sacrifice. There was no provision for this in the law or in the sacrificial system. But today with Christ's sacrifice as an example, Christians can be called upon to lay down their lives in martyrdom for the faith or the church or their brethren or their Lord. In 1 John 3, 16, it says, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And so we may be called upon to uh, offer ourselves for our brothers in a very real way, not just symbolically, but uh, actually. Today, Unlike the past, we can be like Jesus our Lord. We can be both the one who offers the sacrifice as well as the sacrifice being offered. Uh, like Peter and Paul and countless other martyrs uh, throughout history. And so there's a parallel between the sacrificial system, which was a preview to introduce us to the concepts and the actions of what takes place today under Christ. And we see in the Bible that the Moses and Paul and Peter and others use practically the same language to explain the same thing, except uh, the, uh, using different objects and different methods. I, I wanna uh, quote in conclusion to this lesson, I, I want to uh, quote um, a conclusion by uh, Corey Roper, remember, uh, uh, Coy, excuse me, Roper, the, uh, the brother that uh, uh, produced the commentary that I have used for much of uh, this uh, series here. Um, I want to um, uh, 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 quote his conclusion um, in order to kind of uh, you know, round out the discussion that we've had in this particular lesson. So here goes. To be God's holy people, the Israelites had to separate themselves from the world and dedicate themselves to God, and so do we. They had to be cleansed by blood, and so do we. They had to remove uncleanness from the camp, and we must abstain from the sins of the world. They were called to become a community that was centered on the worship of the Lord God, and so are we. Further, they were to become a people who gave to God by presenting sacrifices to Him, and so must we. We don't offer animals or grain. We offer our bodies, our voices, our deeds, our money, and at times, even our lives. I think that's a, a, a good summary of uh, what we've been talking about and what we have tried to demonstrate the parallel between the sacrificial system, which was a preview of the true sacrificial system inaugurated by Christ and emulated by those who follow Jesus Christ in this day and age. Well, that's the end of lesson seven. I encourage you to read 
uh, chapters eight and nine. Again, you may have read them already, but I encourage you to read them again. Uh, that will serve you well uh, as we uh, you know, push on uh, in, our, uh, in our series. I thank you for your attention. God bless you. I hope that the, the lesson itself has been edifying and encouraging and has strengthened your faith. God bless.